By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Camel Trophy with another beautiful match. I'm really looking forward to show you this match because the both of the decks, they're original. You just don't see them often. We have Eric who's playing on a Diamond Valley deck with white and red. I really, really like it. And he's playing against Evo, who's, who's playing this prison, land denial, mana denial, nasty strategy. But it is in a combination of cards that I haven't seen before. Now, I'm sure it's been done before. I'm not saying that, but a combination of cards that I haven't seen before like this. So I'm really looking forward to kind of show you Evo's deck as well and together kind of go through what his plan is and how he wants to accomplish it. And at the same time, Eric's deck is also very cool. One of the cool cards he's playing with, I can already tell you that, is Blazing Effigy. And I think it's super cool. Blazing Effigy and Diamond Valley is just a really nice combination. Now, before I continue with the deck decks, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also skip this section and go straight to the games. The easiest way to do that is by checking out the description below, because there you will find a timestamp marked MTG Games. Click on there, and that will take you straight to the action. In the description below, you can also find more information about the rule set of this tournament. I can already tell you that we were playing according to the gentleman rules. So that means no Mind Twist and no Library of Alexandria in these decks. Okay, so now we're ready to start with the deck deck. I'm actually going to start with the deck of Eric and his Diamond Valley Brew. And here we see the deck of Eric. And um, it's a sweet deck. It's a Diamond Valley deck, red and white. And he's made some interesting choices here. And uh, let's maybe first focus on Diamond Valley, right? Diamond Valley, a card from Arabian Nights. Uh, we see three copies in this deck. You can tap it to sacrifice a creature, gain life equal to the toughness of the creature, right? That's it. And in this deck, we see quite a lot of cards that have great synergy with Diamond Valley. Let's first start with Blazing Evigy. I think it's super cool to see this card. I know it's probably, if Eric, one of your favorite cards. I think it is actually because we talked about it. Uh, Blazing Evigy, one red and one, a card from Legends, comes into play as an 03 creature. Then um, it, it's got some text, and I'm just going to read you the current Oracle text, okay? It reads, when Blazing Effigy dies, it deals X damage to target creature, where X is 3, plus the amount of damage dealt to Blazing Effigy this turn by other sources named Blazing Effigy. So if you've got, for example, two Blazing Effigies on board, you can sec one to your Diamond Valley, gain 3 life for it, then the 3 damage from the Blazing Effigy, you can put on the other Blazing Effigy, then that blazing, blazing Effigy dies, meaning you can deal 6 damage to any target. So that's kind of a nice little like flavor thing. But I think in most um, uh, scenarios in the match, uh, what Eric will do is simply sack his one Blazing Effigy to gain some life and possibly kill like a Hypnotic Spectre or, you know, maybe a Mishra's Factory or some 3 Toughness creature or 2 Toughness creature, maybe a Mana Dork early in the game. I think there are quite a lot of targets for Blazing Effigy. And if you don't have a target, it's got 3 Toughness. So it's pretty good as a blocker as well when you're playing against like a white weenie or an aggro mono green deck. You know, these cards are actually quite good. And again, later in the game with Diamond Valley, you can gain some life and perhaps kill some kill a creature with it. Unfortunately, you cannot target a player. Perhaps then it would be too good, but you can't, okay? Um, so we see the Blazing Effigy here. Another card that goes really well with Diamond Valley is Rook Egg. It's a classical combination. Rook Egg, one red and three, an 03 creature. Uh, if it dies, you get a 4-4 bird token flying at the end of your turn. So what you can do, of course, is play a Rook Egg, sack it to the Diamond Valley, and then get a 4-4 bird token at the end of your turn, which is pretty good bang for your buck. You gain life, you get a 4-4 flyer, and all that for 4 mana, right? That's great value. Another card that goes together really, really well with the Diamond Valley is Preacher. Preacher, we see, I believe, four Preachers in the deck of Eric, so he's heavily invested into the Preacher. Two white and one for this card from the Dark, Tap to gain control of target creature of the choice of your opponent, right? So your opponent gets to choose what creature they want to give you. Now, this is a little bit of a problem with preachers sometimes. You know, your opponent has three creatures on board. You tap your preacher. You say, give me one of your creatures. Of course, your opponent is going to give you the weakest creature that they have, right? The cool thing is with Diamond Valley, you don't have to worry about that stuff. You simply steal a creature, sack it to the Diamond Valley. Next turn, your preacher will untap and you can do the whole thing over again. So... It is, it's really, really nice. Now, um, besides these kind of synergy pieces, combo pieces, uh, we see a lot of business in the deck, of course, to make sure that he doesn't get overrun in the early parts of the game. So we see four swords, 
four lightning bolts, four disenchants. We even see two moats in this deck. So I think this deck is really good against creature heavy strategies because, you know, it can steal a lot of stuff with creature. It can then gain life with Diamond Valley. Later in the game, we see three Sarah Angels and a Sheevan, so it can kind of take uh, take air superiority and win that way. We also see some control elements in the form of Gem Day Tome, you know, draw some extra cards. So, I mean, this is a strong deck, but there is a but because Eric is playing, I believe, against a creatureless deck today, you know, or in this matchup, I should say. So that's going to be really difficult for Eric because his deck is really catered towards playing against creature-heavy decks. I played against um, Eric at this tournament with my green-white weenie deck. I had no chance. I had zero chance. We played two games, and as soon as he saw the Diamond Valley, because I'm not playing with City in a Bottle, I'm like, oh man, I need an Ice Storm quickly or I'm toast. And I think we played um, three games, maybe even four, Eric, I can't remember, but I lost all of them. No chance. But now he's playing against Ifo, who's playing Creatures. You know what? Let's take a look at uh, Ifo's prison deck. And here we see the deck of Evo. So this is really a prison deck based on Mana Denial. Um, before I go into all that, I just want to talk about the base of the deck. You know, Evo wants to destroy his opponent through Black Vice and Ankh of Mishra. Those are the two cards that are going to actually deal the damage. Now, Black Vice is a card that punishes the opponent for having more than four cards in hand. So for every card above four, you take a damage. So if you have seven cards in hand during your upkeep, you take three points of damage. Now, Ank of Mishra is an artifact for two that punishes you for playing out lands. Every time you play out a land, you take two damage. Now, of course, these two artifacts go hand in hand perfectly because, you know, when you have a black vice, what you want to do as the opponent is you want to try to empty your hand. In order to empty your hand, you have to play lands because with lands, you can cast your spells, right? But Ank of Mishra punishes you for playing out the lands. So basically, black vice, Ank of Mishra puts you in this catch-22 situation that, you know, Either if you go left or right, it doesn't matter. You're going to take damage anyway. So I always really like that combination. You see it a lot in ATOC decks. Now, in this deck, it's actually way more brutal than in an ATOC deck because what Evo wants to do after that is he just wants to destroy all the lands or before that, he doesn't care. I mean, he's got four sinkhole, four ice storms. He's also playing with unsummons on top. So even if you get some creatures out, he can destroy your lands, then unsummon them, send them back to your hand and you won't have any mana anymore to play it out. So it's super mean. Um, he's also playing with the four crumbles that I mentioned earlier. They, they are there, of course, to destroy any mana rocks. This deck is really focused on destroying the mana base. Then we also see Nether Voids. Nether Voids, of course, is going to tax everybody for playing out spells. And that's going to be super difficult for the opponent because, you know, Evo, he only wants to play out the Vice, the Ankh of Mishra. They're pretty cheap. He doesn't really care about the Nether Void tax. Uh, but for his opponent, it's going to be super tough, especially with all the land removal. And then there's this card we don't see that often, and I just quickly want to discuss it with you. The card is called Mana Vortex. So Mana Vortex is a card from The Dark, two blue and one to cast for his enchantment that reads, when you cast this spell, counter it unless you sacrifice a land. I'm reading the current Oracle text, by the way. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player sacrifices a land. When there are no lands on the battlefield, sacrifice Mana Vortex. So this card is just super brutal, right? Because you have your Black Vice on board, you have your Ankh of Mishra on board, and you're kind of forcing your opponent to sack his lands. If When you're the opponent, you're probably going to stop playing out lands because you've got to sack them to the Vortex anyway. So you don't want to do that, of course. So it's, it's going to hold you back. It's going to force you to take damage from the Vice. And again, you know, Evo, he doesn't mind tossing away his lands. That's part of his strategy. He doesn't care. Um, so th this is just going to be really rough for uh, for, Eric, for Eric to to play against. So good luck, Eric. Uh, Evo, what a nasty deck! And I guess we've now looked at both of the decks, and uh, and we're ready. So let's go to the games. Game number one here is about to start. So we see Eric on the left with his Blazing Effigy Diamond Valley deck, and on the right we see Evo with his Mana Prison deck. That is going to be brutal. So I'm really, really interested in seeing this matchup and see if Eric can kind of play underneath all that land destruction. There we see a plateau. At least he's on the play, giving him a slight advantage. But um, yeah, Eric doesn't really have a fast game, and that's what I'm kind of worried about. He's going to give Evo all the space he needs to start his whole land destruction prison plan. He's starting with the Sol Ring. Really good start for Evo ramping up here. That means next turn he probably can play some land destruction. Let's see what Eric can do against it. Maybe a Blazing Avagy. There is a Strip Mine on the sea. Okay, that's pretty good. 
kind of holding Evo back a little bit. That probably means that he cannot get too black to cast a sinkhole, but he does have ice storms as well, of course. There's a bayou on the side of Evo tapping it. There's an ice storm taking care of the plateau and passing the turn. Really cool playmats by both players, by the way. The Old Man of the Sea by Evo and the Blazing Avigy playmat by Eric. There we see a City of Brass tapping the city, so taking a damage, gonna go to 19. Ancestral Recall showing some power muscle. And drawing three, so that is pretty good. I wonder what he's going to do next. If he's got another Ice Storm, that would be ideal, of course, for him. But, I mean, remember... Um, oh, there's a Black Vice. Okay, so he can start dealing some damage. What I wanted to say is there could be a scenario for Evo as well, of course, where his hand is full of useless, useless cards for now, like creature removal cards like Paralyze and Unsummon, maybe some Crumbles, and there's not really a target for that now. So that's, that's good news, I guess, for Eric, who's now charging a bolt towards Evo, who's going to drop to 16 here. And that's a Hammerheim, by the way. That's the land that Eric just played. So he's going to drop to 16. And I guess that's a pass turn. And this is, of course, good good news for Eric, kind of emptying his hand. He had seven in hand. He played a land and the bolt, so he now has five in hand. So he will only take one damage from the vice next turn. And Evo now looking at his hand again. What can he do? There is an island. Tapping the island. Tapping the City of Brass, taking a damage, tapping the Soul Ring, and oh, there's the Mana Vortex that we talked about in the deck deck. So Mana Vortex and Enchantment where when you play it, you have to sack a land. So you see Evo here sacking an island, but during uh, the upkeep, each player has to sack a land. So, I mean, this is going to be super brutal. There we see a Demonic Tutor as well. Now he's already played out his Ancestral. He could go for the Mind Twist. Although, if, do you want a twist with a vice? Probably not. Is he playing with the twist, actually? I'm kind of assuming he's playing with the mind twist. He's not, actually, because we're playing Gentleman's Rules, of course. So he's not playing with the mind twist. So that's not an option for him to look up. That's kind of my autopilot when I see somebody who's already played on Ancestral Recall, casting Demonic, then uh, you would expect him to go for a mind twist. So mind twist actually wouldn't really work in the deck of Evo because he wants his opponent to have cards in hand for the vice to work. So now he's got a sack, a land... And he's playing a Plains. Okay, okay, so he sacked the Hammerheim, playing a second Plains. There's a Disenchant on the Vice. And he took one damage there from the Vice. So now Evo also has to sack a land, so he's going to sack the City of Brass, it seems. So the City is going to go. And the question here for Evo is, does he have another Vice? Because that is basically his win con. If he doesn't have a Vice, he's just going to wait probably for the, for the Mana Vortex to bleed out. So the Mana Vortex goes out of the game when there are no more lands in play. So Evo could just wait for that moment to happen and, and keep his cards in hand. It's not his main plan. I think the ideal scenario here for Evo is, is playing a Vice and an Ank, but it, he doesn't have them, it seems, just passing the turn. So Eric now has to sack another land to the Mana Vortex, so one Plains. I think if you're Eric, you also just don't really want to do anything. You just want to pass the turn. And he's asking, like, what's going to happen then next? And I think Evo's going to explain how this card works. You don't see it that often, so it's understandable that, you know, players are asking, what does the card actually do? How does it work? You could compare it with Pestilence. Like, Pestilence also buries itself when there are no more creatures in play, and Mana Vortex does the same when there are no more lands in play. Tapping the Soul Ring. Okay, there is the Chaos Orb and a pass turn. Now he's going to lose the planes. Mana Vortex is going to go, so now Eric can play Lance again. He's going to play a City of Brass and pass the turn. There we see a Bayou and a pass, so no land destruction. So giving Eric a little bit of space, there's a Diamond Valley and a pass. So this is bad news for Eric, right, that he has to play at the Diamond Valley. He would have rather played out a Mana Land like a Plains or a Duel or a City of Brass, but he doesn't have it, obviously. That's why he's playing out the Diamond Valley. Instead, he's going to pass. An option for Evo here would be to flip on the City of Brass. 
There is the Nether Void. This is so brutal. So Nether Void and Enchantment from Legends Enchant World. Meaning that you have to pay three extra for your spells. Which is super difficult, of course, when you're you know, playing against a land destruction deck. There we see Eric playing a second Diamond Valley and passing the turn. If Evo can now find a vice, I mean, he's doing what he wants to do. But he needs to find a way to actually deal some damage. And he's passing the turn. So Evo is just waiting to find the right cards in his deck here to start dealing some damage. He needs an Ankh and preferably a Black Vice also passing turn. I think both players now have seven cards in hand. And Eric, of course, he's just, he's going to discard. We can't see it, unfortunately, but he had to discard a card there. And Eric, of course, is just waiting for more lands. I think we see an Ice Storm perhaps in hand there for Evo. But then again, if it was an Ice Storm, he would play it out by now. So it's probably another card, but it looked like an Ice Storm. They're on the right side of his hand. It's kind of hard to see. And again, a discard by Eric and a pass. So both players are just kind of top decking and trying to find something to work with. And of course, this happens often when you're playing against a prison deck. The prison is there. The lock is there. But the prison deck cannot find anything to deal damage to you. It does happen. Here we see an Ankh of Mishra on the side of Evo. So bad news, of course for Eric, because that means if he finds a land from the top of the deck and plays it out, he's going to take some damage. And he's going to tap three here. It looks like he's going to play out something else. Oh, he's got to pay three, of course, for the Mox of the Nether Void. Yep, that makes sense. I missed that completely. And Eric just uh, discarding and passing turn again. Again, he's got to pay for the Mox Jet. That's kind of funny to see. And passing the turn. And he's now discarding the Sword to Plowshares. Of course, Eric realizing by now that, you know, he doesn't need any creature removal in this matchup. So that's going to give him a slight advantage, actually, after game uh, game one. There we see a City of Brass by Evo in a pass. You see this often, by the way, when you play against like Prison decks, Combo decks. Uh, after the first game, it gets tougher because then your opponent knows about your plan. So Evo, he's tapping four. Okay, there's a single tapping five. Single on the City of Brass, making it even worse for Eric. I think if you're Eric, you're now already thinking, okay, I'm just going to get a beer or something. There's another Ankh. Now, I think what's important here is that these rounds are timed. So when you're playing against these prison decks and you're in a lock, you could consider scooping if you of course have enough information because a reason to continue playing is seeing more of the deck so i also understand eric's point here that he wants to see more of the deck there we see an ice storm oof this is just really tough and this is exactly what ifo wants to do right here we can see eric's life dropping and dropping and dropping because of the ankh of mishras and we can now really see ifo's deck in full swing the only component that he's missing currently is the black vice and like I said, if you're Eric, you're basically now using this first game for information. You're trying to find as much information as you can. Eric's saying, you know what, <laughs> you've got this one. But I understand Eric's point that he continued playing, you know, to see, okay, what does Evo want to do? What cards does he have? And, and, and now Eric knows. So both players are going to sideboard. Eric can board at all his creature removal, right? Uh, maybe add some extra disenchants, maybe some extra artifact removal. So, yeah, this is going to be definitely interesting. I'm really looking forward to the second game. So, but first, let's uh, let these players sideboard and then we'll catch up with them in game uh, number two. Game uh, number two, here we go. So it's Eric, of course, on the play again, starting with some ramp here in the form of a Mox Pearl. No Blazing Effigy, though. There's an Underground Sea by Evo and a pass. So Eric's going to play out a Mishra's Factory. At least I can put some pressure on. And Evo, is he going to play a sinkhole, for example, if he can find another black source? No, he cannot. There's a forest and a pass. So kind of a slow start. Now, is Eric going to attack? If he does, of course, he does open himself up to a potential a possible crumble. I mean, yep, there's the crumble. Yep. Crumble of Factory feels really good, I can tell you that. It's like crumbles made from Isher's Factory. But this is bad news for Eric, of course. He was hoping to put some early pressure on. <laughs> and there we see a sideboard card. Oh, yes, he's playing out the gloom. Okay. Funny, yeah. So Gloom and Enchantment uh, coming from the sideboard means all uh, the white spells 
of Eric have an extra ta uh, tax of three. So that's uh, pretty rough for Eric to deal with. So again, this is like a bad start for Eric. I kind of feel like he's already with his back against the wall. Evo playing the Tropical Island. Of course, I mean, Eric still has like direct damage and red spells and it's not the end of the world, but with knowing what Evo's deck is about, he's kind of already closing in on Eric. So there's the Ang of Mishra, by the way, now dealing damage to Eric's gonna drop to 18. Remember, every time a player plays land from this point forward, they're gonna take two points of damage because of the Ang of Mishra. There's a bolt. So I think this is really an important part of Eric's strategy, just trying to deal as much damage as quickly as he can before Evo has his Evo lock on the board. I think if you're if you're Eric, if you can play, ah, but of course the disenchanted stacks as well. Oh mana vortex, this is rough. And remember, um, even if Eric has a disenchant, he's got to pay three extra because of the glooms. That means five for a disenchant. He can't play that. And because of the Vortex, he's got a sack lance. This is horrible. What you need against the Mana Vortex is actually more Moxen. You need Moxen, you need Mana Dorks, you know, Lana were Elves, Birds of Paradise. Those kind of cards can work quite well. But of course, Evo also has Creature Removal. He's got Paralyzes, which work really well against Mana Dorks. And again, we see Eric, he just has to sack lands and, and he's got to wait his time. Remember, Mana Vortex goes away when there are no more lands in play. It's such a good land destruction spell for Evo, you know, because now Evo has just this one card that's taking care of two lands of his opponent. That's exactly what he wants. Now he's getting rid of the Mana Vortex as well. Of course, he's losing lands as well. Don't get me wrong. But again, if you're Evo, you don't really mind. Taking damage from the Ankh, of course. And here we see Eric taking damage as well. Going to drop to 16. Okay, there's another Bolt. I think this is a good strategy by Eric, you know, just throw the bolts at the face of Evo. And maybe you can deal some extra damage with like, I don't know, factory or something. And of course, he's also taking damage himself because of the Ankh, so that really helps Eric here. He's going to take damage from the Ankh now as well, he's going to drop to 14 and pass turn. But Evo is already on 10, I mean, his life total has halved. There we see a vice though. Ooh, that is tough. This is tough for Eric. So now we've got the traditional vice Ankh of Mishra plan going. Eric dropping to 12. Playing a land, gonna drop to 10. Oh, this is difficult. Is there a way out for Eric? Evo's on 10. I wonder if he's considering playing out another land, going to 8, and then maybe play an Ice Storm or something, or a Sinkhole. Would be a little bit risky. Of course, Evo knows he's playing against a red player. Okay, there we see a demonic tutor. Interesting. I wonder what he's going to tutor up. Maybe another vice. If he's got two vices on board, that would mean six damage a turn because I think Eric's currently holding seven cards in hand. And remember, uh, Evo didn't have a land drop yet, so he could drop a land, take two damage, go to eight, and then play the vice. So he's going to put away the tutor. Demonic Tutor is, is also so good in prison decks because you usually like need one or two more components to really like win the game. Evo's just passing the turn. Interesting. And Eric's only taking two damage, meaning he's got six in hand, not seven. Taking two damage again from the Ankh. Disenchant. <laughs> but he is taking the two damage for the Ankh, right? I'm, I think maybe he forgot or maybe he didn't have enough cards in hand to take damage from the Vice. That could be possible as well. Anyway, both players are on eight right now. There we see a Nether Void. Oh, this is such bad news for Eric. He finally got rid of the Gloom and now he's got to deal with a Nether Void that's going to basically give him the same tax. Going to take a damage from the Vice, going to drop to seven. I do believe, to be honest, that he missed that, that Ang damage earlier, but that can happen, of course. Disenchant on the Void. I mean, I'm pretty sure he boarded in, if he doesn't already play with four Disenchants, boarded in extra Disenchants from the sideboard. I would have to have another look at his deck list. Oh, another Nether Void. This is so frustrating if you're Eric. You're like, what? Oh, man. And now I kind of feel like, uh, didn't Evo miss the damage from his own City of Breath? He should be on six. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong. Anyway, there is another land and... Oh, nice. 
A Dust to Dust. I like that. Dust to Dust, a card from the dark. You can remove two artifacts from play. Card from the sideboard. Really nice to see it being played out here by Eric. Eric, by the way, dropped to four because he played another land. But now the Anx at least gone. So Eric can play out lands without hurting himself. So that's good news for him. And Evil, you're looking at his hand. I mean, remember, his spells also are taxed by the Nether Void. It works both ways, right? It's an enchant world. So he also has to pay three extra if he wants to cast a spell. Tapping, taking a damage, gonna drop to six. What is he gonna play out? An Ancestral Recall, a Crumble, wow. Playing a Crumble for four just to take care of the, uh, the Mox Pearl. And that makes sense, you really wanna attack that mana base. But Evo is also kind of low on mana, you know? I mean, I'm sure he would have wanted some extra mana to be able to cast like Ice Storm, for example. There we see a Divine Offering. So obviously Eric is just boarded in a lot of artifact destruction and that makes sense. And you can kind of see this game, it's slowly going more towards Eric. And, you know, yes, Eric's on four, but look at the life total of Evo. Evo's on six. So... I mean, there's definitely an option here. If Eric has a Fireball, okay, Disenchant. Oh, of course, he's got to pay three extra for the Fireball. But now he Disenchanted the Nether Void. So perhaps next turn, if he's got a Fireball or Disintegrate or whatever, then he can deal four damage, of course. he's Evo's on six. I'm, I'm mixing the life totals up here, sorry. But anyway, Evo's on six. I'm getting excited here because Eric, maybe he's going to win this, this second game. Oh, there's a Gloom again. So annoying. But it, the Gloom doesn't matter for Burn. Let's see if Eric can find some burn. Tapping five. There's a fireball. There's the burn I talked about. Ooh, blue elemental blast. That is unfortunate for Eric. That is unfortunate. Blue elemental blast saving the day for Evo. Tapping a black. Okay, there's a vice. Four cards in hand. There's an Ice Storm as well. With the Nether Void gone, it's easier now for also for Evo to play out his spells. Taking care of a land. There's another. Okay, there's a Rook Egg. At least that's something. But now he has to find a way to kill his own Rook Egg. If he can find a Diamond Valley, he can sack it to the Valley. That would be quite good. There's an Egg of Mishra. Diamond Valley would be ideal. It would drop him to two, but he could sack the Egg, could go back up to five, then have a 4 4 bird. We haven't seen a single Diamond Valley yet. Tapping four, there's a Jam Day Tome. No lands from Eric in a pass. And also Evo just drawing a card in pass. So giving Eric a little bit of head space here. He's got four cards in hand, no damage from Vice. If he can find the Diamond Valley, that would be super good for him. Tapping four to draw cards. He's going to go to five cards in hand. That is kind of risky with that vice on the table. Passing the turn. But it makes sense, of course, trying to find maybe some lands or that Diamond Valley that we talked about. Three cards in hand for Evo. Evo passing turn. One damage here for Eric. Going to drop to three. This is an exciting game number two. And this is tough, right, for Eric, because you're now like, do I want to use my tome to dig deeper and try to find that land? Or am I just going to dig a hole for myself because then I'm going to have more cards in hand and the vice will do more damage. He's going to tap five. Going to play a balance. Ooh, this is kind of nice because you want to get rid of the egg. This is pretty sweet. Three cards in hand for Evo. So Eric's going to lose a land, going to lose the egg. He's going to get the 4-4 bird back for that. This is really nice. Now, I am expecting Evo to have an answer for creatures because, you know, his deck has answers. But if not, it would be really, really good news. There we see the 4-4 bird. And actually for Eric, it's also kind of nice to discard some cards. There is a blue elemental blast. Ooh, but he can't because the token is colorless. It's not red. Or is it? I think it's red. It is a red bird token. So both players are going to check if it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. So he's going to destroy the bird. 
And there's the pass from Ivo. So just top decking passing. Oh, this is interesting. So there's the artifact that can make black mana. That is funny. I wonder if he's playing with Karma in the sideboard. I didn't really look at the sideboards. Anyway, there's a flip here. Gonna go on the Cyclopean Tomb. So Cyclopean Tomb, you can pay some mana, tap it, and then you can turn target land into a swamp. It's pretty cool. You put a counter on it. It's really an old school card. Five cards in hand there for Eric, passing the turn. He's on three though. Ooh, it's looking bad for Eric. Gonna drop to two. That Hank still on board. Ooh, it's gonna put Evo on three. He's so close. He's so close. What an exciting game too. I'm rooting for Eric here. I want us to be 1-1 one, one, and that we get to see a game number three. He's gonna take a damage. He's gonna go to one. Do it. Do it. No, nothing here. Oh, you were so close, Eric. I could smell your victory. But you didn't make it. And Evo, man, I mean, like I said in the deck deck, I, in my opinion, y you were a high favorite because your deck is kind of catered towards the type of deck that Eric's playing. And nonetheless, Eric, you were, you were so close. You know, trying to board in, of course, more artifact removal, more enchantment removal after that game number one and trying to board in as much direct damage as you had play as aggressive as you possibly could. And you did, you did, you did, you did. You were so, so close. Anyway, congratulations to Evo. And of course, both players, thank you very much for showing your decks right here on Timmy Talks. What a beautiful battle it was. And if you enjoyed this, please come back next week, Friday, because then we have more action from the Camel Trophy, because I've got a lot more games and uh, they were quite exciting. It was a nice little tournament. Now, before you go, I would like to thank you for watching another video right here on Timmy Talks. Please remember to like and share this on your socials if you want. And of course, leave a comment. All these three things are completely free and they really help the channel move forward. And then there's one last thing that you can do and that's become a patron of Timmy Talks. So if you enjoy what I'm doing, you can actually support me financially. You can keep the channel alive by becoming a patron. It already starts with just $1 a month. And how does it work? Very simple. There's an info card popping up right now. Click on that info card. That will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page where you can find all the ins and outs. And one of the sweet perks is that your name will be mentioned at the end of every episode in the end scroll. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee!